The Princess, Part 4, by Alfred Lord Tennyson. There sinks the nebulous star we call the sun, if that hypothesis of theirs be sound, said Ida. Let us down and rest, and we down from the lean and wrinkled precipices, by every coppice feathered chasm and cleft, dropped through the ambrosial gloom to where below no bigger than a glowworm shone the tent lamp lit from the inner. Once. She leaned on me, descending. Once or twice she lent her hand, and blissful palpitations in the blood, stirring a sudden transport rose and fell. But when we planted level feet, and DIPT beneath the satin dome and entered in, their leaning deep embroidered down we sank our elbows, on a tripod in the midst of fragrant flame rose, and before us glowed fruit, blossom, viand, amber wine, and gold. Then she, let someone sing to us. Lightlier move the minutes fledged with music, and a maid, of those beside her, smote her harp, and sang. Tears, idle tears, I know not what they mean. Tears from the depth of some divine despair rise in the heart, and gather to the eyes, in looking on the happy autumn fields, and thinking of the days that are no more. Fresh as the first beam glittering on a sail, that brings our friends up from the underworld, sad as the last which reddens over one that sinks with all we love below the verge, so sad, so fresh, the days that are no more. Ah, sad and strange as in dark summer dawns the earliest pipe of half-awakened birds to dying ears, when unto dying eyes the casement slowly grows. A glimmering square, so sad, so strange, the days that are no more. Dear as remembered kisses after death, and sweet as those by hopeless fancy feigned on lips that are for others. Deep as love, deep as first love, and wild with all regret. O oh death in life, the days that are no more. She ended with such passion that the tear, she sang of, shook and fell, an erring. Pearl lost in her bosom. But with some disdain answered the princess, if indeed their haunt about the mouldered lodges of the past so sweet a voice and vague, fatal to men. Well needs it we should cram our ears with wool and so pace by, but thine are fancies hatched in silken folded idleness, nor is it wiser to weep a true occasion lost, but trim our sails, and let old bygones be, while down the streams that float us each and all to the issue, goes, like glittering bergs of ice, throne after throne, and molten on the waste becomes a cloud, for all things serve their time toward that great year of equal mights and rights, nor would I fight with iron laws, in the end found golden. Let the past be past. Let be their cancelled babbles, though the rough kecks. Break the starred mosaic, and the beard-blown goat hang on the shaft, and the wild fig tree split their monstrous idols, care not while we hear a trumpet in the distance pealing news of better, and hope, a poising eagle, burns above the unrisen morrow. Then to me, know you no song of your own land, she said, not such as moans about the retrospect, but deals with the other. Distance in the hues of promise, not a death's head at the wine. Then I remembered one myself had made, what time I watched the swallow winging south from mine own land, part made long since, and part now while I sang, and maidenlike as far as I could ape their treble, did I sing. O oh, swallow, swallow, flying, flying south, fly to her, and fall upon her gilded eaves, and tell her, tell her, what I tell to thee. O oh, tell her, swallow, thou that knowest each, that bright and fierce and fickle is the south, and dark and true and tender is the north. O oh, swallow, swallow, if I could follow, and light upon her lattice, I would pipe and trill, and cheep and twitter twenty million loves. O oh, were I thou that she might take me in, and lay me on her bosom, and her heart would rock the snowy cradle till I died. Why lingereth she to clothe her heart with love? delaying as the tender ash delays to clothe herself, when all the woods are green? O oh, tell her, swallow, that thy brood is flown. Say to her, I do but wanton in the south, but in the north long since my nest is made. O oh, tell her, brief is life but love is. Long and brief the sun of summer in the north, and brief the moon of beauty in the south. O oh, swallow, flying from the golden woods, fly to her, and pipe and woo her, and make her mine, and tell her, tell her, that I follow thee. I ceased, and all the ladies, each at each, like the Ithacensian suitors in old time, stared with great eyes, and laughed with alien lips, and knew not what they meant, for still my voice rang false, but smiling, not for thee, she said, O Bulbul, 
any rose of Gulistan shall burst her veil. Marsh divers, rather, maid, shall croak thee sister, or the meadow crake greater harsh kindred in the grass, and this a mere love poem. Oh for such, my friend, we hold them slight, they mind us of the time when we made bricks in Egypt. Knaves are men, that lute and flute fantastic tenderness, and dress the victim to the offering up, and paint the gates of hell with paradise, and play the slave to gain the tyranny. Poor soul, I had a maid of honor once, she wept her true eyes blind for such a one, a rogue of canzones and serenades. I loved her, peace be with her, she is dead, so they blaspheme the muse. But, great is song used to great ends. Ourself have often tried Valkyrian hymns, or into rhythm have dashed the passion of the prophetess. For song is doer unto freedom, force and growth of spirit than to junketing and love. Love is it? Would this same mock love, and this mock hymen were laid up like winter bats, till all men grew to rate us at our worth, not vassals to be beat, nor pretty babes to be dandled, no, but living wills, and sphered whole in ourselves in ode to none. Enough, but now to leaven play with profit, you, know you no song, the true growth of your soil, that gives the manners of your country women? She spoke and turned her sumptuous head with eyes of shining expectation fixed on mine. Then while I dragged my brains for such a song, Cyril, with whom the bell-mouthed glass had wrought, or mastered by the sense of sport, began to troll a careless, careless tavern catch of Maul and Meg, and strange experiences unmeet for ladies. Florian nodded at him, I frowning. Psyche flushed and wand and shook. The lily-like Melissa drooped her brows. Forbear, the princess cried. Forbear, sir, I, and heed it. Through and through with wrath and love, I smote him on the breast. He started up. There rose a shriek as of a city sacked. Melissa clamored, flee the death. To horse, said Ida. Home. To horse. And fled, as flies a troop of snowy doves athwart the dusk, when some one batters at the dovecote doors, disorderly the women. Alone I stood with Florian, cursing Cyril, vexed at heart, in the pavilion. There like parting hopes I heard them passing from me, hoof by hoof, and every hoof a knell to my desires, clanged on the bridge, and then another shriek, the head, the head, the princess, oh the head. For blind with rage she missed the plank, and rolled in the river. Out I sprang from glow to gloom, there whirled her white robe like a blossomed branch wrapped to the horrible fall. A glance I gave, no more. But woman vested as I was plunged, and the flood drew, yet I caught her, then oaring one arm, and bearing in my left the weight of all the hopes of half the world, strove to buffet to land in vain. A tree was half disrooted from his place and stooped to wrench his dark locks in the gurgling wave mid-channel. Right on. This we drove and caught, and grasping down the boughs I gained the shore. There stood her maidens glimmeringly grouped in the hollow bank. One reaching forward drew my burthen from mine arms. They cried, she lives. They bore her back into the tent. But I, so much a kind of shame within me wrought, not yet endured to meet her opening eyes, nor found my friends, but pushed alone. On foot, for since her horse was lost I left her mine, across the woods, and less from Indian craft than bee-like instinct hiveward, found at length the garden portals. Two great statues, art and science, caryatids, lifted up a weight of emblem, and betwixt were valves of open work in which the hunter rued his rash intrusion, manlike, but his brows had sprouted, and the branches thereupon spread out at top, and grimly spiked the gates. A little space was left between the horns, through which I clambered o'er at top with pain, dropped on the sward, and up the linden walks, and, toast on thoughts that changed from hue to hue, now pouring on the glowworm, now the star, I paced the terrace, till the bear had wheeled through a great arc his seven slow suns. A. Step of lightest echo, then a loftier form than female, moving through the uncertain gloom, disturbed me with the doubt, if this were she, but it was Florian. Hist oh hist, he said, they seek us. Out so late is out of rules. Moreover, seize the strangers, is the cry. How came you here? I told him. I, said he, last of the train, a moral leper, I, to whom none spake. Half sick at heart, returned. Arriving all confused among the rest with hooded brows I crept into the hall, and, couched behind a Judith, 
underneath the head of Holofernes peeped and saw. Girl after girl was called to trial. Each disclaimed all knowledge of us. Last of all, Melissa. Trust me, sir, I pitied her. She, questioned if she knew us men, at first was silent. Closer. Pressed, denied it not. And then, demanded if her mother knew, or Psyche, she affirmed not, or denied. From whence the royal mind, familiar with her, easily gathered either guilt. She sent for Psyche, but she was not there. She called for Psyche's child to cast it from the doors. She sent for Blanche to accuse her face to face, and I slipped out. But whither will you now? And where? Or Psyche? Cyril? Both are fled. What if together? That were not so well. Would rather we had never come. I dread his wildness, and the chances of the dark. And yet, I said, you wrong him more than I that struck him. This is proper to the clown, though smocked, or furred and purpled, still the clown, to harm the thing that trusts him, and to shame that which he says he loves. For Cyril, howe'er he deal in frolic, as tonight, the song might have been worse and sinned in grosser lips beyond all pardon, as it is, I hold these flashes on the surface or not he. He has a solid base of temperament, but as the water lily starts and slides upon the level in little puffs of wind, though anchored to the bottom, such as he. Scarce had I ceased when, from a tamarisk near two proctors leapt upon us, crying, names. He, standing still, was clutched. But I began to thrid the musky circled mazes, wind and double in and out the bowls, and race by all the fountains. Fleet I was of foot. Before me showered the rose in flakes. Behind I heard the puffed pursuer. At mine ear bubbled the nightingale and heeded not, and secret laughter. Tickled all my soul. At last I hooked my ankle in a vine, that clasped the feet of a nemosine, and falling on my face was caught and known. They hailed us to the princess where she sat high in the hall. Above her drooped a lamp, and made the single jewel on her brow burn like the mystic fire on a masthead, prophet of storm. A handmaid on each side bowed toward her, combing out. Her long black hair damp from the river, and close behind her stood eight daughters of the plough, stronger than men, huge women blowzed with health, and wind, and rain, and labor. Each was like a druid rock, or like a spire of land that stands apart cleft from the main, and wailed about with mews. Then, as we came, the crowd dividing clove and advent to the throne, and there beside, half naked as if caught at once from bed and tumbled on the purple footcloth, lay the lily shining child, and on the left, bowed on her palms and folded up from wrong, her round white shoulder shaken with her sobs, Melissa knelt. But Lady Blanche erect stood up and spake, an affluent orator. It was not thus, O oh princess, in old days, you prized my counsel, lived. Upon my lips, I led you then to all the castalies, I fed you with the milk of every muse, I loved you like this kneeler, and you me your second mother, those were gracious times. Then came your new friend, you began to change, I saw it and grieved, to slacken and to cool, till taken with her seeming openness you turned your warmer currents all to her, to me you froze, this was my mead for all, yet I bore up in part from ancient love, and partly that I hoped to win you back, and partly conscious of my own deserts, and partly that you were my civil head, and chiefly you were born for something great, in which I might your fellow worker be, when time should serve, and thus a noble scheme grew up from seed we too long since had sown, in us true growth, in her a Jonah's gourd, up in one night and due to sudden sun, we took this palace, but even from the first you stood in your own light and darkened mine. What student came but that you planed her path to Lady Psyche, younger, not so wise, a foreigner, and I your countrywoman, I your old friend and tried, she knew in all? But still her lists were swelled and mine were lean, yet I bore up in hope she would be known. Then came these wolves, Tilda they Tilda knew her, Tilda they Tilda endured, long closeted with her the yestermorn, to tell her what they were, and she to hear, and me none told. Not less to an eye like mine a lidless watcher of the public wheel, last night, their mask was patent, and my foot was to you. But I thought again, I feared to meet a cold, we thank you, we shall hear of it from Lady Psyche. You had gone to her, she told, perforce, and winning easy grace no doubt, for slight delay, remained among us in our young nursery still unknown, 
the stem less grain than touchwood, while my honest heat were all miscounted as malignant haste to push my rival out of place and power. But public use required she should be known, and since my oath was ton for public use, I broke the letter of it to keep the sense. I spoke not then at first, but watched them well, saw that they kept apart, no mischief done, and yet this day, though you should hate me for it, I came to tell you, found that you had gone, ridden to the hills, she likewise, now, I thought, that surely she will speak, if not, then I, did she, these monsters, blazon what they were, according to the coarseness of their kind, for thus I hear, and known at last, my work, and full of cowardice and guilty shame, I grant in her some sense of shame, she flies, and I remain on whom to wreak your rage, I, that have lent my life to build up yours, I that have wasted here health, wealth, and time, and talent, I you know it, I will not boast, dismiss me, and I prophesy your plan, divorced from my experience, will be chaff for every gust of chance, and men will say we did not know the real light, but chase the wisp that flickers where no foot can tread. She ceased. The princess answered coldly, Good. Your oath is broken. We dismiss you. Go. For this lost lamb, she pointed to the child, our mind is changed. We take it to ourself. Thereat the lady stretched a vulture throat, and shot from crooked lips a haggard smile. The plan was mine. I built the nest, she said, to hatch the cuckoo. Rise. And stooped to updrag Melissa. She, half on her mother propped, half drooping from her, turned her face, and cast a liquid look on Ida, full of prayer, which melted Florian's fancy as she hung, a Niobean daughter, one arm out, appealing to the bolts of heaven. And while we gazed upon her came a little stir about the doors, and on a sudden rushed among us, out of breath as one pursued, a woman post in flying raiment. Fear stared in her eyes, and chalked her face, and winged her transit to the throne, whereby she fell delivering sealed dispatches which the head took half amazed, and in her lion's mood tore open, silent we with blind surmise regarding, while she read, till over brow and cheek and bosom break the wrathful bloom as of some fire against a stormy cloud, when the wild peasant writes himself, the rick flames, and his anger reddens in the heavens for anger most it seemed, while now her breast, beaten with some great passion at her heart, palpitated, her hand shook, and we heard in the dead hush the papers that she held rustle. At once the lost lamb at her feet sent out a bitter bleeding for its dam. The plaintive cry jarred on her ire. She crushed the scrolls together, made a sudden turn as if to speak, but, utterance failing her, she whirled them on to me, as who should say, read, and I. Read. Two letters, one her sire's. Fair daughter, when we sent the prince your way, we knew not your ungracious laws, which learnt, we, conscious of what temper you are built, came all in haste to hinder wrong, but fell into his father's hands, who has this night, you lying close upon his territory, slipped round and in the dark invested you, and here he keeps me hostage for his son. The second was my father's running thus, you have our son. Touch not a hair of his head. Render him up unscathed. Give him your hand. Cleave to your contract. Though indeed we hear you hold the woman as the better man. A rampant heresy, such as if it spread would make all women kick against their lords through all the world, and which might well deserve that we this. Knight should pluck your palace down, and we will do it, unless you send us back our son, on the instant, whole. So far I read, and then stood up and spoke impetuously. Oh, not to pry and peer on your reserve, but led by golden wishes, and a hope the child of regal compact, did I break your precinct. Not a scorner of your sex but venerator, zealous it should be all that it might be. Hear me, for I bear, though man, yet human, whatsoe'er your wrongs, from the flaxen curl to the grey lock a life less mine than yours. My nurse would tell me of you, I babbled for you, as babies for the moon, vague brightness. When a boy, you stooped to me from all high places, lived in all fair lights, came in long breezes wrapped from inmost south and blown to inmost north. At eve and dawn with Ida, 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 rang the woods. The leader wild swan in among the stars would clang it, and lapped in wreaths of glowworm light the mellow breaker murmured Ida. Now, because I would have reached you, had you been sphered up with Cassiopeia, or the enthroned Persephone in Hades, 
Now at length, those winters of abeyance all worn out, a man I came to see. You, but indeed, not in this frequence can I lend full tongue, O noble Ida, to those thoughts that wait on you, their centre. Let me say but this, that many a famous man and woman, town and landscape, have I heard of, after seen the dwarfs of presage, though when known, there grew another kind of beauty and detail made them worth knowing, but in your I found my boyish dream, involved and dazzled down and mastered, while that after beauty makes such head from act to act, from hour to hour, within me, that except you slay me here, according to your bitter statute book, I cannot cease to follow you, as they say the seal does music, who desire you more than growing boys their manhood, dying lips, with many thousand matters left to do, the breath of life, oh more than poor men wealth, than sick men health, yours, yours, not mine, but half without you, with you, whole, and of those halves you worthiest, and howe'er you block and bar your heart with system out from mine, I hold that it becomes no man to nurse despair, but in the teeth of clenched antagonisms to follow up the worthiest till he die, yet that I came not all. Unauthorized behold your father's letter, on one knee kneeling, I gave it, which she caught, and dashed unopened at her feet, a tide of fierce invective seemed to wait behind her lips, as waits a river level with the dam ready to burst and flood the world with foam, and so she would have spoken, but there rose a hubbub in the court of half the maids gathered together, from the illumined hall long lanes of splendor slanted o'er a press of snowy shoulders, thick as herded ewes, and rainbow robes, and gems and gem-like eyes, and gold and golden heads. They to and fro fluctuated, as flowers in storm, some red, some pale, all open-mouthed, all gazing to the light, some crying there was an army in the land, and some that men were in the very walls, and some they cared not, till a clamor grew as of a new world babble, woman built, and worse confounded. High above them stood the placid marble muses, looking peace. Not peace she looked, the head, but rising up robed in the long night of her deep hair, so to the open window moved, remaining there fixed like a beacon tower above the waves of tempest, when the crimson rolling. Eye glares ruin, and the wild birds on the light dash themselves dead. She stretched her arms and called across the tumult and the tumult fell. What fear ye, brawlers? Am not I your head? On me, 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 the storm first breaks. Tilda I tilda dare all these male thunderbolts. What is it ye fear? Peace. There are those to avenge us and they come. If not, myself were like enough, oh. Girls, to unfurl the maiden banner of our rights, and clad in iron burst the ranks of war, or, falling, promartyr of our cause, die. Yet I blame you not so much for fear. Six thousand years of fear have made you that from which I would redeem you. But for those that stir this hubbub you and you, I know your faces there in the crowd. Tomorrow morn we hold a great convention. Then shall they that love their voices more than duty, learn with whom they deal, dismissed in shame to live no wiser than their mothers, household stuff, live chattels, mincers of each other's fame, full of weak poison, turnspits for the clown, the drunkard's football, laughing stocks of time, whose brains are in their hands and in their heels but fit to flaunt, to dress, to dance, to thrum, to tramp, to scream, to burnish, and to scour, forever slaves at home and fools abroad. She, ending, waved her hands. Thereat the crowd muttering, dissolved. Then with a smile, that looked a stroke of cruel sunshine on the cliff, when all the glens are drowned in azure gloom of thunder shower, she floated to us and said, You have done well and like a gentleman, and like a prince. You have our thanks for all, and you look well too in your woman's dress. Well have you done and like a gentleman. You saved our life. We owe you bitter thanks. Better have died and spilt our bones in the flood. Then men had said, But now, what hinders me to take such bloody vengeance on you both? Yet since our father, wasps in our good hive, you would be quenchers of the light to be, barbarians, grosser than your native bears, oh would I had his scepter for one hour. You that have dared to break our bound, and gulled our servants, wronged and lied and thwarted us, tilde I tilde wed with thee. Tilde I tilde bound by precontract your bride, our bond slave. Not though all the gold that veins the world were packed to make your crown, and every spoken tongue should lord you. 
Sir, your falsehood and yourself are hateful to us. I trample on your offers and on you. Be gone. We will not look upon you more. Here, push them out at gates. In wrath she spake. Then those eight mighty daughters of the plough bent their broad faces toward us and addressed their motion. Twice I sought to plead my cause, but on my shoulder hung. Their heavy hands, the weight of destiny. So from her face they pushed us, down the steps, and through the court, and with grim laughter thrust us out at gates. We crossed the street and gained a petty mound beyond it, whence we saw the lights and heard the voices murmuring. While I listened, came on a sudden the weird seizure and the doubt. I seemed to move among a world of ghosts. The princess with her monstrous woman guard, the jest and earnest working side by side, the cataract and the tumult and the kings were shadows, and the long fantastic night with all its doings had and had not been, and all things were and were not. This went by as strangely as it came, and on my spirit settled a gentle cloud of melancholy. Not long, I shook it off. For spite of doubts and sudden ghostly shadowings I was one to whom the touch of all mischance but came as night to him that sitting on a hill sees the midsummer, midnight, Norway sun set into sunrise, then we moved away. Thy voice is heard through rolling drums, that beat to battle where he stands. Thy face across his fancy comes, and gives the battle to his hands. A moment, while the trumpets blow, he sees his brood about thy knee. The next, like fire he meets the foe, and strikes him dead for thine and thee. So Lilia sang. We thought her half-possessed, she struck such warbling fury through the words. And, after, feigning peek at what she called the raillery, or grotesque, or false sublime, like one that wishes at a dance to change the music, clapped her hands and cried for war, or some grand fight to kill and make an end, and he that next inherited the tale half turning to the broken statue, said, Sir Ralph has got your colors, if I prove your knight, and fight your battle, what for me? It chanced, her empty glove upon the tomb lay by her like a model of her hand. She took it and she flung it. Fight, she said, and make us all we would be, great and good. He knight-like in his cap instead of cask, a cap of Tyrol borrowed from the hall, arranged the favor, and assumed the prince. 